Hello, everyone. Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us for this another fireside chat. It is actually the 26th day of September, and here we are one more Tuesday evening sitting at the fireside. This is where we meet each Tuesday at this time, 8 p.m. Eastern. It's where we have those conversations. It's where we learn and it's where we grow. We want to thank everyone who is in the room tonight. If you are a first time uh, visitor, let me say visitor to this room, we want to thank you so much for coming. And for those who have been with us for the last three years since August 2020, we want to thank you so much for continuing to come each Tuesday night. We do not take this lightly. We are glad that you chose to be with us at this fireside on a Tuesday. Each Tuesday we have another, you know, I always call it exciting and interesting guest <laughs> who come to share with us around the fireside. And tonight is actually no different. As a matter of fact, I am so waiting for tonight's program. Because guess what happened? Every single one of us want to be wealthy. I don't know about you, but I want to even understand wealth. And Dexy, we all want to achieve financial stability. <laughs> and so this is what we're here to talk about tonight. And in a moment, I'm going to be bringing my guest to the spotlight and I'm going to be introducing him to our audience and we're going to get the show on the road here as we sit at the fireside tonight and so let me get a hold of my guest and get him to the fireside let's all right thank you so much here we are so we have as our guest tonight uh mr andrew clark and Mr. Clark is the CEO of Expanding Wallet and a financial empowerment coach. And he specializes in teaching skills for creating generational wealth. Andrew is also a certified public speaker trained on the Les Brown. He was inspired to start Expanding Wallet during the COVID-19 pandemic, reflecting after reflecting on his own financial journey and knowing others would benefit from his help. Andrew helped clients build a strong financial foundation for building wealth by providing the knowledge, the strategies, and the systems that they can incorporate in their lives. Andrew is on a mission to transform lives for a generation to come. And this is what we're in for tonight. So I'm going to ask you just to take a moment. Please share the link out. Ping someone who you know needs to be in this room. We need to be 40 and over in this room tonight because we need a lot more persons to come in and learn about how to create that generational wealth. And Mr. Clark, welcome to the Fireside Chat. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Janice. I'm really happy to be here and uh, haven't done a fireside chat in a while. So this will uh, be very fun. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much again. We do appreciate your presence. And we are going to get on the road because we are going to be in here for the next hour or so. And just a, a rule or two, if you, in this room, we use the chat a lot. You hear a comment, you hear something that speaks to you, go ahead and drop it in the chat. Because at the end of the program, in the last 15 or so minutes, we are going to open the floor so that persons who still have questions, you hear something and you want him to expand on it. Save those questions, drop them in the chat, make the comments so that we can leave this room all filled up tonight. So my first question to you, Mr. Clark, I, I am so intrigued by this financial, um, financial wealth and um, generational wealth. 
And maybe the reason why is because I spent 28 years myself in banking. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to share your journey with us as a successful entrepreneur, helping people to build this generational wealth that we're talking about. What inspired you to really choose this field? It's a great question. So what really inspired me, um, I would say it was a combination of things. So one, childhood experiences, uh, a passion for finances, and then really a vision from God. Um, that vision from God is is a key one. Um, I felt like when 2020 hit and I reflected on where I was in life um, with COVID and everything, um, I felt that I was truly blessed because there are multiple areas of my life where I came from behind and rose to the top, um, including academically, uh, financially, and even in my career. Um, so um, just looking at that, I knew that um, if I were to apply the things that I had learned and the things that I've done and build a business around that, I could definitely help people to transform their lives. And so that was really what was the inspiration for that. Um, in terms of childhood and growing up, um, we actually migrated, my mom and I migrated from Jamaica to the U.S. when I was very young. So I am, <laughs> I was born in Jamaica, um, but I've lived in the U.S. pretty much my whole life. But um, at that time when my mom came here, she started her whole life over. Um, first job, she was only making $4 an hour. So that would translate to about 9 to $10 an hour in today's money to give you perspective. So it was not easy, right? And so, um, you know, I understood what it was like to have a low income. Um, she paid her way through school, worked a lot of hours, paid her way through school to become a nurse. But even after becoming a nurse, she still worked a lot of hours. Um, my mom took care of our family here in the U.S., but also those back home in Jamaica. I'm sure many Jamaicans understand that having family members back home who who couldn't support themselves. And she put all of us on her back. And when I say she works worked a lot of hours, uh, over 100 hours a week for years. So not a small number. Um, and so, um, you know, by the time I turned 15 years old, I just kind of looked at it as, you know, at what point does it end, right? And, and there's got to be a better way to make money. And so this is what turned me to start self-educating myself on finances. Um, you know, there are there's a lot of gaps in the educational system around finances. And so I started reading books. Um, YouTube wasn't even around actually at that time. So um, I started reading books. And as I read books, I started to understand finances better, started to actually understand the importance of real estate when it comes to building wealth. And so um, one of the first books I read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And my mom actually reminded me of the poor dad in the story, educated, but um, basically living um, every day to work, right? There's no, if, if, and I always wondered, you know, with her working that many hours, what would happen if she couldn't go to work one day, right? Or if she got sick and was in the hospital for a few months, right? And so there'd be no money coming in. And so um, that's where real estate steps in. And the idea of having additional passive income um, really made a lot of sense. And when I talked to my mom, she thought it made sense too. And so um, didn't really know much about real estate investing at the time. And so she ended up getting a real estate license when I was 16. Um, so from that point on, I started kind of learning in the background how real estate agents work. Um, at 18, before I went to college, um, I went to college at the University of Minnesota for biomedical engineering. But the summer before starting, I actually got my real estate license. Um, the plan was that I would, you know, have my license and I'd be able to help her and make some money while I'm going to college and hopefully save up enough to buy a property um, pretty soon after graduating. Well, I got my license in August of 2007. So probably one of the worst times to possibly get your real estate license. Um, the market started to go down by November of 2007. Um, but what I will say is that um, it taught me so many valuable lessons around finances. Um, because as I talk to clients or potential clients, um, I started to realize how few of them really understood, you know, basic things such as budgeting. And fast forward to today, nothing has changed in terms of that. A lot of people still have that that gap in knowledge. And um, I actually witnessed a lot of friends, families lose their houses to foreclosure during that time. Um, so, again, the importance of financial knowledge is key. 
Um, I also, during that time, started to be trained by real estate investing gurus. So these guys had billions of dollars in property. And many of them had also lost money too because of this. Um, but they were recovering very quickly. And so um, I realized too that a lot of these guys didn't come from like wealthy backgrounds. Some of them had very average jobs, but they had learned how to master money. And so um, I ended up actually giving up my license in 2009 so I could just focus on school because the market was just so slow. But I never stopped learning. And I really started focusing on those fond foundational elements of finance. Um, and when I talk, I'll talk more about that probably a little later, but those are how you manage your money, debt, and credit. And so while I was in school, because the market had dropped and I really didn't have the income, um, I knew that there was one thing I could work on and that, well, two things, one, keeping my debt low and then increasing my credit score as much as possible um, because I had a goal of buying a property within a year of graduating. And so um, I focused on that and I ended up buying my first property at 24 years old, um, a duplex. And then um, it wasn't easy. I don't I, I think I say this and then it just sounds easy, but there's definitely some hurdles along the way. But um, bought the property at 24. Um, by 26, I actually paid off the debt I owed from money I used to renovate the duplex as well as um, my student loans from college. So by 26, really, the only debt I had was just the mortgage on the property. And so um, there's a lot to probably discuss on that. Um, but multifamily can be very, very helpful, especially in terms of your first property and in terms of helping you to get out of debt and build generational wealth. Wow. I, I knew this was going to be <laughs> something that we needed to hear. A success story indeed. As I listen to you and, and just, you know, when you began, you talk about the vision from God and you talk about this childhood experiences, just those two, you know, coming here and all that happened. That is indeed a success story. Ladies and gentlemen, I saw quite a number of persons came into the room since we just started, since we last started. And I just want to share again that we're talking with um, Mr. Andrew Clark and we are talking about the power of wealth. Uh, achieving financial stability. Wow. Achieving financial stability. And every single one of us at some point in time want to get to that place of financial stability. And so I want you once again, go ahead, ping some more persons into this room so they too can come in and be part of this discussion that we're having here. So, so Mr. Clark, uh, you, you, you shared a lot right in that first section. I'm just waiting to hear more, but uh, you, um, inside of everything that you do, you offer programs that are focused primarily on the, the financial um, health uh, uh, of people and, and their relationship with finance. I want you to talk to us a little more about that. How does this program work? What are they like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, when I kicked off the company in 2020, um, really I focused heavily on a lot of free content. Um, so for example, blog articles. So if you go to expandingwallet.com, there's blog articles on there. Um, we also have a YouTube channel. So um, also YouTube videos. So that's, you know, that side of it. And then um, more recently really kicked off a financial course. Um, that was last year. And that was more from a group basis, but also a lot of online um, on-demand videos. Um, so you can watch as you go. And then we had some, some group coaching, right? So um, similar to this, you'd get on Zoom and then, you know, we can have a discussion about the topics that were covered. And then um, last year, also towards the end of last year, I started doing private coaching. So one-on-one -on -one with clients. Um, and from that, I learned a lot. Um, and, and I've got some plans. I, I know you have some questions later on kind of future plans. So I can share a little bit more about that and what I've learned through private coaching. But probably the biggest thing I've learned from private coaching versus group coaching is um, accountability. I think that's a huge word um, when it comes to something like finances, something that can be challenging for people. 
Um, it's easy to try to, you know, turn away from it. Um, but if you have somebody who can help to hold you accountable, um, that can kept, keep you moving forward, even through challenging times. Excellent. Excellent. So you have the YouTube, the website, the group coaching, and then you went down to um, individual coaching. So yeah. that, that's excellent. So so let's let's talk a little bit more now about um because when we think about finance and finance pertaining to everything, because somebody said that if if people had money, then at least 90% of their problems would be solved <laughs> if they had money. So why do you think that people struggle so much when it comes to financial health and building wealth? Well, I think we probably just have to look at, you know, how do people learn about money, right? How do we learn about finances? So typically it's parents, right? So that's going to be your first educators, your parents. Um, so for example, right, my mom, even when she was making $4 an hour, she still saved money. So one of her biggest principles was you have to save money. Um, doesn't matter if it's 10 cents or a dollar, but that consistency, that habit, um, very important. And so before I even knew the word budget, I had actually been saving money and setting aside a certain amount of money um, for my first job. So um, not everybody has that, right? So they might learn other things from their parents. Maybe those are not going to help you um, move yourself towards building wealth. It could might move you in the other direction. So that's one. And then another area um, where we learn about finances is school. Um, so unfortunately, school doesn't really teach us a ton about finances. Um, school was really designed to help you help to teach you how to work for money, not show you how to um, have your money work for you. So big difference there. And then lastly, I would say it's who you surround yourself with. So if your friends and family are talking about buying assets and building wealth, you're probably more likely to also buy assets and build wealth. But if they're talking about the latest uh, shoes that came out or the latest purse that came out or the latest, you know, iPhone, right, you're probably more likely to spend money on liability. So I think those are some key areas. And I think um, one thing that's nice is maybe you never had someone who talked about finances or money. And so I think that's where coaching or being in a program or a course that I have, um, that's where that can help by changing your environment. Indeed. I like the two points you made about the people you surround yourself with. And later on in the program, we're going to ask some more questions about saving. <laughs> and what is an ideal uh, uh, percentage that people should save considering everything else that is happening. But I want to I wanna run along with a few more questions. Um, so I want you to share with the audience, what are some strategies that people can use to create generational wealth? And, you know, some kind of core principles that will help them to achieve this lasting financial success that most people are looking for? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is really just saving money, right? I think you kind of touched on that. And so, um, you know, having money is key, but also having good credit and low debt, right? And so this is where this, um, what I realized from those guys that those real estate gurus, right, is that they had what I call a good, they had a solid foundation for building wealth. And that foundation is really dependent on how you manage your money, debt, and credit. And so the key is mastering your ability, um, your ability to master managing those. That's that's key. Um, and one thing I can say, and if you want to write it down, it's when we lack financial skills, money flows through our hands like water. Um, it just slips through our hands, right? Because um, for one, right, a budget, right? What does that do? It just get, it has, a, it's a plan for your money for every dollar, right? Because in life, we're always in this like constant battle. And the battle is between living now and planning and preparing for the future. And a budget really helps you find that balance. Um, so that's one thing I would say is really is focus on, you know, those three, how you manage your money, debt, and credit. Um, and why those key three are important, right? Money is kind of the obvious one. If you have enough cash, you can buy an asset, right? Like a house. But most people, especially your first property, you're not going to have enough cash to buy that. And so now you need to rely on debt. And what is one of the things that they're going to look at is one, they're going to look at how much debt you already have. 
right? Your debt to income ratio, that's important. And then the third thing is they're going to look at um, aside from the cash on hand, that would have been another one, but they're going to look at what's your credit score. And that's really a reflection of your, your ability to handle money um, in terms of that's not yours. So um, you got to really, really be careful with those three. But, but, but I, I, I have a follow-up question here because somebody would say that you talk about good credit, you talk about having a, a acceptable credit score, but somebody would be saying, well, how do I get there? Because this thing is skewed um, mm -hmm. based on race and other factors. Uh, how do I really get there? Yeah, I think that's I think that's a key is, right, you got to kind of know the game you're playing, right? You got to know the rules of the game. Um, seriously, right? Like Like playing a board game. It's hard to win if you don't know the rules. So I think that's key first off. Um, it is trying to understand that, right? And and like you said, it it may not it wasn't necessarily maybe built for someone that looks like us, right? And so, you know, in order to win, you've got to understand the rules of it. And I think that was something that was key. Um, when I mentioned that, you know, when I was in college, one of the things I did, I didn't have necessarily the income, so I couldn't really save at that point for a property. But what I could do was work on my credit and use the money that I did have. So it was learning the game at that early age and planning and strategizing. And it does take some time to build up credit. Um, and even if you, you've had bad credit, you can always build it back up. It doesn't last forever. Um, bad credit doesn't last forever, but again, it takes time and, and you know, some planning and strategy. And I'm going to come with another question even before we get to mm -hmm. <laughs> the end of this session because this is getting more and more interesting as you speak. I'm 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 finding you know more ways things are happening in my head here because I, I'm actually thinking um what is really um what is really unacceptable. Uh, let, let me put it this way. What is really an acceptable time frame that persons would be able to really build good credit if they had no credit at all? I think that, yeah, I guess that kind of depends. But I would say for me, um, if you want time frame, right? So I actually got my first credit card at 18 and I bought the property the week I turned 24. So that was a lot of time. Now, you know, where was my credit score, you know, maybe two years before that. So maybe by, you know, I would say, for me, I would say, if you had no, if you're starting from scratch, you know, I would try to give myself three to five years, honestly, um, to really build that up. There's, there's certain factors that affect your credit score, such as just paying your credit cards, paying, paying bills, you owe, right, just paying things on time. Um, and then there's other things too, like the diversity of credit. So the different types of credits that credit um, credit that you're utilizing. So it could be like credit cards, car payments. So that's another factor too, where you know that might take some years to develop that. Um, so that's why I say give yourself some time to uh, really get that score up. And another reason I say that too is especially in terms of housing. Um, just by having a slightly higher score can dramatically impact the loan percentage that you get. So that'll save you some money over time. There are, <clears throat> sorry, there are some factors to be considered right there. Thank you so much for expressing that. So we're, when we talk about people's relationship with money, because that is like an underlying sickness, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we're, Based on their relationship with money, many persons never get to a desired um, level when it comes to building financial wealth. Talk to us what it means when we talk about people's relationship with money. Well, I think one thing is just um, what I've seen sometimes people are scared, right? Scared when it comes to money. Um, they don't want to look at their bank account, right? They... And, and, you know, one thing that um, there was a statistic um, in 2020, banks collected, I believe it was $12 billion, $12.4 billion in overdraft fees alone. 
Um, now, a lot of banks have gone away with, with overdraft fees. So that number has been coming down, but I don't think it was necessarily because people got so much better with managing their money, right? We just got rid of that in a lot of cases. Um, but that's a scary thing when you think that these banks that are already so rich that they collected just $12.4 billion in just overdraft fees. Um, and so one of the things I would say in terms of that relationship is really facing it like anything in life, right? Any challenge, any problem, you really have to face it to get past it. And so um, I think that's one of the things that I would say is like for people, um, especially if they work with a coach or, or anyone related in the financial industry that's helping you with your money, right? You're going to have to look at it closer maybe than you would have on your, on your own. Um, and I think as you just kind of look at it more and you're plugging into maybe a system and working on a budget, maybe it's your first time doing that, um, the more you do it, I think the more you get comfortable with it. And I think then it looks like less of a challenge. Uh, I'm just also thinking, um, Andrew, Mr. Clark, sorry. Okay. What, what If we were to dig a little deeper, what where, where is this coming from? People's mm -hmm. fear of facing their their financial status or situation. Where I think do a you lot think of, that is coming from? Well, I think a lot of times it might even come from what you've heard about money, right? Growing up, you know, what what did you hear about money? Um, one of the questions I usually ask, so before I work with someone, I'll usually do a, a informational interview, you could call it, and just kind of get to know them and their goals. But um, I usually send out a questionnaire and I'll ask them one of the questions, what did you hear about money growing up? And that can have a very, very um, big impact on your life, um, probably more from a subconscious level. This isn't something that I'm like an expert in the whole subconscious, but I have done personal development courses um, for myself on these things. And and you realize that, you know, if if you've heard that, you know, anyone with money is evil, right, then subconsciously, right, that's going to work against you if you're trying to build wealth for yourself, right? So you know, those little things like that, that could actually affect you as well in terms of um, wealth building. I totally agree with that because even when growing up, and I'm, I'm sure many persons from the Caribbean can also attest to that you're growing up and, and, and your parents would say to you, go get a job to pay your bills. Mm. And so, you know, people go work to pay their bills, not to do anything else. So exactly. Yeah. That just really hit hard home. But, but let's 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 talk a little bit about some common misconceptions or myths about financial wealth and investing, or even managing finance that you often encounter in your own work. And and how do you actually debunk some of these misconceptions when you hear them? So I think probably just the biggest one is that it's very difficult to manage your finances. It's very difficult to manage your money. Um, and I think that, you know, um, for a lot of people, it's it's really because they never had a plan. They never had a system for it. And, and I'd say that how I help them is really um, what I've learned over the course of three years of helping people and um, in multiple different ways of helping them. Um, it's that when it comes to financial skills, people really lack three key items, um, and that's financial knowledge, strategies, and systems. And so those are the three that I focus on with my clients. And so um, in terms of systems, I actually put together what I call the Financial Empowerment Toolkit um, to really help my clients better manage money, debt, and credit the things that I said, that's your foundation for building wealth. And so when you can take control of those three in a powerful way, you know, you can accelerate your wealth building. Financial knowledge, strategies, and system coupled with exactly. the money, the debt, and the credit. I like that very much. <laughs> so, so let me ask you, um, and, and we're going to come to that in the end. Let, let me let me run along because I I have so much questions. That is each time you talk, another question come to mind. But let's save some of those for the end. Um. So you are a wealth builder, and you work with many different clients. I'm sure you have a, a, a variety, a range of clients. Yes. Um. 
And I'm sure you you would have had many success stories along the way or, you know, ways that clients have been transformed, um, benefiting from your guidance and your programs. Can you share any of those success stories, maybe one or two of success stories that you have had yeah, uh, that would help to strengthen others? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I've definitely worked with a wide range of clients, um, you know, income wise varies a lot, too, from like, you know, six figures to you know, under 50K. Um, but one that I will share um, more recently, um, she was an administrative assistant. And, um, you know, when I started working with her, um, when it came to finances, was not very confident, even in how she talked when we started doing our meetings. And we worked together for six months. And during that six months, she was able to save an additional $6,500. Um, so that was a significant amount of money. Now, her goal wasn't necessary to buy a house at the time. It was more to buy a car because she was taking the bus. So she'll definitely be able to buy a car probably by the end of this year. Um, but um, the real transformation, I would say, was really her confidence. Um, and that $6,500 will probably be small in comparison also to what she would save over a lifetime um, with the skills that she gained. But the confidence, that was what I started to notice. So, um, you know, her, uh, how she presented herself month one versus month three and by month six, right? Big, big, big difference because she was so much more confident about her finances and her future. And I think that's what I want to see. And that's why I call myself a financial empowerment coach, not just a financial coach, because I really want to empower people. And I love to see that confidence um, that people gain after working with me. Wow, I, I love that. So you would really say confidence is key? In, I, I in think, like, you know, there's a fake it till you make it. I, I, don't, I don't think that applies with finances. But, but I think that it's truly, you know, developing the skills, right, and that foundation. And, you know, um, I've learned a lot of things over the years um, in multiple different areas. And, and, I, and I've learned that there's three layers to knowledge. There's the, the surface level, which is uh, general knowledge and terminology. Then you've got the strategy layer, and then you have actual experience. And so when you can get those three levels um, in whatever you're learning, and that's what she was getting, right? She was actually applying, applying what she was learning. So um, she gained real confidence. Okay, thank you so much for that for expanding on that. So, you have you have talked to us about that client, and I think that was an excellent success story. Um, coming to six um sixty five hundred in six months, but can you share some personal lessons from your own journey as an entrepreneur and wealth strategist that really has had a profound impact on your approach to life and finance? Yeah, that's a great question. Um. I would say it's probably two critical things that you want to have in mind. And it's really one, knowing what you want in life. And two is knowing what season you're in, in life. Because when you know those two, it'll help guide you in making critical life decisions. And if you don't, you might make some decisions that are actually going to move you away from your goals instead of move you towards them. Um, so for example, right, I talked about, you know, when I turned 24, I bought the property. But what I didn't talk about was when I got my first job out of college um, as a software consultant, I um, was actually underpaid by nearly 20%. So because I had this goal, right, the, the vision was clear. What I wanted was I wanted to buy a property within a year of graduating because the housing market had dipped significantly while I was in college. But by the time I had been graduating, it was going up around 10 to 12 percent a year. And so I knew that, you know, the average person gets a raise between three to five percent. So um, if I didn't significantly cut expenses, I wouldn't be able to save up fast enough to hit that goal. So, you know, that's where you look at a budget and you have to make some adjustments. So one of the adjustments I made was, well, I can't buy a house and a car. Um, I wouldn't be able to save up enough for the down payment if I went out and bought a new car. A lot of college students, that's the first thing they do, right? So one of the things I had to do, I had to just use my high school car that I had um, and just, you know, drive that and get, kind of got some flack for it. Um, someone I knew was like, why don't you go buy a new car that's rusty? I don't want to be seen in it, you know, but 
it doesn't matter, right? And that's that's why your purpose has to be so clear and your vision has to be clear because you you know you don't want to be influenced by other people because ten years later you could potentially be in the same spot and wondering why, right? Uh, so it wasn't easy to do, but just having that clarity and really, like I said, knowing the season that I was in um, really helped me. Excellent, excellent. And I'm I'm going to come back to to the question when we get there about the the assets and mm -hmm. what to keep and what not to keep, because that's a very critical, you talked about you driving that car. <laughs> oh yeah. <But> you, <laughs> you had a major reason for driving that car. Absolutely. Went to, and I drove it to 220,000 miles. <laughs> Still going. No, I got a new one, but. <laughs> no, no, no. I said at 220 miles, it was still going. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But it, <laughs> it served its purpose. <laughs> Excellent success story right there. But, well, you know, well, you, you've shared a lot. And I, I want to ask you, what next for you in terms of this mission that you have to empower others in the financial well-being area? And, and just to add to that, what are some exciting projects or initiatives? Or what else is on the horizon for you here now? Um, really, I'd say two two things. Um, more so probably for next year with the first one, but do more public speaking. Um, like you mentioned, I was I'm a certified public speaking speaker. Truly was just blessed to cross path with some amazing, amazing speakers. Deirdre Van Ness, um, keynote speaker around the world, and then the famous Mr. Les Brown himself. Um, being able to work and be trained by those two um, was truly a blessing. And so um, really to probably just leverage that more, um, I think that's maybe more on the motivational and inspirational side, but I think, um, you know, that plays a part in the finances, which for some, for some people that can be really boring, just sitting there hearing about numbers, things like that. So um, if I can, you know, uh, spice it up a little bit and put some fire under them, um, I'm happy to do that. And then the second thing in terms of initiatives, um, this is more, um, happening now. Um, right now, I'm actually in the works of redeveloping um, and offering more courses um, and also bringing in another co coach. Um, and the, the reason for uh, the additional courses really leveraging what I learned from um, just doing the one-on-one -on -one private coaching um, and being able to, to help more with the accountability and also have more offerings that um, can work for you know a wider range of budgets. Excellent. So many persons sitting in this room and somebody may be saying, how can I work with you? How can I connect with you? How can I contact you? Um, what do I need to do to be able to work with you? Um, but, but before you answer that question, you talked a little bit about the, the, um, the real estate part of it and you talk about the financial education. Mm -hmm. How how deep are you on the real estate side? So what do you offer on that side? Yeah, in terms of that side, that's probably more on the private coaching side. Um, I don't have my, I don't personally have my real estate license anymore, but I definitely have a lot of referral partners in the real estate industry. But what I can, what I typically do with clients is really make sure they have balance in terms of when they have properties. Um, I have a client who's in her 20s and actually about to close her fourth real estate deal. So her goal is really heavily passive income. But um, the one side of real estate um, is that when you continue to take on debt, inherently there's more risk. Um, and so trying to really work with her to balance out um, bringing down some of her debt um, or a significant portion actually of her debt while also still growing her portfolio um, long term to have that passive income that she can retire on. Excellent. How can people find you? I mean, how can they connect with you? Um, um, the best way probably to connect with me is just uh, via email, um, info at expandingwallet.com. Um, that's my email. I'll drop it in there. Um, oh. Also, social media, LinkedIn, um, probably the best, Andrew Clark. Uh, at LinkedIn. I, I don't know the actual URL offhand, but um, if you look me up or expandingwallet.com. 
Wonderful. I actually see the hands going up already because <laughs> I know it was it. it was such a really interesting. I could be throwing a hundred more questions because I love this topic so much. <laughs> but I am going to allow the audience to throw in their questions because 